Welcome to part six of An American's Guide to Blasiewicz. If this is your first time watching this series, let me tell you what it's about. My wife is Yugoslavian. She was born in Yugoslavia, and her favorite singer is George Blasiewicz. I realized at a certain point that in order to truly love her and truly understand her, I had to understand him and his music. So I've been going through each one of his albums, one by one, and doing a sort of analysis. And what's fun about it is I am not familiar with this music at all. Uh, my last review was of the first album that he released with his band Rani Mraz, uh, Moyo Imami. Uh, and I, I reviewed that album, and I'd never heard it before, and I liked it quite a bit. I'll include a link up there. And then I get to this one, Oladzi Circus. And for, for this one, apparently this is one of his most popular albums, jam-packed with some of his biggest hits. But to me, they were all brand new. You may hear some noises. Behind me, uh, both of my dogs, Bo and Toby, are sleeping, and Bo is snoring quite a bit. And my wife, the doctor and Mrs. Moya Jena, uh, she's back there, and she may be helping me with some pronunciation. How did I do on circus? Circus. Circus. Okay. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. So this is the thing. For each of these reviews, I try to look at the work as a whole. So even though he was a prolific uh, writer, and even though he wrote a lot of great singles and a lot of good individual ideas, I've picked up on the fact that you can look at his albums and see a couple of overarching themes that, that are seen all the way throughout the album. And this album presents quite a few, and it was hard for me to pick one to really focus on. It's the theme of failed or failing love. This is an album which is very painful. It's filled with people in great states of duress who have loved and lost and lost and made other people lose. Or people leaving their lovers for good reasons, for bad reasons, and most often for tragically stupid reasons, meaning not good reasons that lead to personal tragedy. There's another somewhat less prevalent theme on the album, which is Balashevich asking what kind of artist am I? I think that's going to be one that's going to pop up a lot because that was part of uh, his previous album with Rani Miraz as well. Like, who is he as a musician? How does he fit into the musical landscape of Yugoslavia in the late 1970s and early 1980s? I think the way that we can put all these things under one roof, under one circus tent, how do you say circus tent? Circus Kishata. Uh, under one circus di sarsta <laughs> is on the theme of romanticism and more particularly the dangers of romanticism. I believe this is an album largely against the romantic. Now let me make this clear. I don't mean romantic as in oh I love you or the way that I love my wife. That's not what I mean. I mean in the more of a literary meaning of the term romantic in which one has an idealized view of reality. So instead of dealing with reality on its own terms, you have a sort of fiction in your head about what life could be, what your life could be. Often you could see it as seeing your life as though you're living in a book. Romantic themes are often around tragic love, lost love, dying young, dying for love, dying for your country, heroism of most sorts is tied into this concept of the romantic. The problem is, if you actually live your life in a romantic mode, it's usually selfish. It usually hurts the people around you, and it rarely results in any meaningful happiness. I think this is found in this album that Blasiewicz has given us. I think it's in there, because as we now know, truth about happiness isn't having secure connections to people who love and respect you. Yet, this romantic vision of the world, of tragedy and big sweeping actions and idealized visions, is glorified in all cultures at all times. The opposite of romantic is realist. And the weird reality is, often, like, like being a realist can lead to a more fulfilling love life, can lead to a more fulfilling sense of self and a better loving relationship, like I have with Mojena over there. That means my wife in Serbian, by the way. That's not her name. I, don't, I never say her name on the channel. Um, so we have this, these two different ways of looking at reality. 
the romantic and the realist. And it is worth mentioning that romantic has at its root Roman, R-O-M-A-N, which is how you say a novel in France. And it turns out it's also how you say a novel in Serbian, as in a book of fiction, Roman. How do I do? Great, Roman. Roman. So let's think about this like living your life in a book, because I think that's a lot of what's happening in Oda Zi Circus. One of the great ironies of fiction, of novels, is that perhaps the greatest early novel, certainly the greatest early novel not written in French by Francois Rabelais, one of the greatest early novels is written in Spanish by Cervantes' Don Quixote. You know, if you think about like, what are the earliest greatest examples of what a work of fiction should be, long form prose fiction, Don Quixote is number one in most people's list. Yet, the themes of Don Quixote are anti-romantic. That's what the whole book is about. It's about a foolish knight who thinks that he's a knight, but he's not really. By the time that book is published, knights had basically extinguished in Spain. It's somebody who falls in love with this woman, Dulcinea, who in reality isn't much more than just kind of a common peasant woman. I think it's a, I'm going somewhere with this comparison to Don Quixote, because this, there's a, a word that's associated, at least in English, not in Serbian, I'm not sure, called quixotic, which is the foolish pursuit of romantic ideals. Many of the figures in this album are quixotic. They are pursuing these romantic ideals. But what makes this album more interesting than many other, uh, any other works that cover romanticism is it is about the reality of being a romantic that leads to you being sad and isolated. Now I'm gonna get back to Don Quixote later because Blasiewicz mentions him directly on this album. And apparently, at other times in his career, but I don't know. I've only listened to like five Blasiewicz albums at this point. And talk to you about another novel. Listen, I'm a French professor, okay? I'm talking about romanticism. I have to talk about Madame Bovary. Gustave Flaubert in the 19th century wrote Madame Bovary, which is another great al uh, book about romanticism. It's about a young woman who sees her life again as though she were a character in a book. And she sees herself as something truly great and magnificent and destined for greatness. And this passion, this unrealistic, idealized version of herself leads to her destruction and the destruction of her whole family. One of the most interesting, challenging, and best things about Madame Bovary is found in its introduction. Flaubert completely destroys romanticism in this book. And I remember reading this when I was 20, 21 years old and thinking, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you get it. I see all these fools around me on the college campus, you know, with their like affect and I'm a punk and I'm a hippie. Not me, man, I live my life real, I'm not a romantic. But in the introduction to the greatest destruction of romantic values ever found, Flaubert says, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. I am Madame Bovary. As a 20 year old, I couldn't understand this. I was so upset. I'm like, no, you're not. You're destroying those stupid idiots. But now that I'm in my 40s, I understand what he means. He is a romantic. He may be destroying romanticism, but it's something that he suffers from and something he is trying to understand. I think this is the mode that we should imagine Balashevich in in this album. He suffers from his own romanticism. He's very clearly a romantic in all senses of the word. The first album, Moye Mami, he shows himself as this gallant artist standing aside from his contemporaries, standing aside from his family, following his dreams. He just keeps on talking about sna, 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 which means dreams and sleep. Is it really the same word for sleep and dreams? Sun. Sun. The noun, yes. Okay. The, there are... By the way, if you didn't know, learning Serbo-Croatian is highly difficult. So, you know, you know, he was that way, but this album shows how dangerous it can be. So at the same time, as I think you could listen to this album and think of it as an unironic 
romantic album filled with these themes of love, lost, lived. It's actually about the destruction. It's about the result of that kind of living. I would say the most dangerous of all romantic myths is that of the vagabond, the person who can't stay in one place, who has to just keep rambling and moving on. That's who he is for most of this album. And we see where it leads. These characters who leave, they end in a pub dying. Basically all of them, over and over and over again. So this central conflict, the romantic and the realist, is going to be shown throughout this album. And at one point, I believe they're even going to be deified to some extent. And we are actually going to be questioning the gods of romanticism versus the god of realism. Pretty epic stuff. Musically, this album is interesting coming right off of Moyo Imami. There's a lot less going on in this album in a lot of ways. Moyo Imami, the first album, came out the year previous, has violin and saxophone. This album is just a lot more meat and potatoes, fairly standard, late 70s, early 80s, soft rock. Lots of slide guitar. That's the main difference with this album versus anything else. Just, I, I think it's Josip Boshek, again, uh, who's producing the album and playing the guitar. He's just having lots of fun with this slide guitar. It doesn't feel quite as folky as the first album, although it is at points. Uh, it, doesn't, it feels a little bit less referential to the past. It's a little bit more straightforward. Let's talk about how the whole thing starts. Pricha o vasi ladachkom. Excellent. Excellent. It's a real journey of a song. When we compare it to the first song off of the other Rani Mraz album, Uvad, Introduction, it's hilarious. I mean, Uvad basically never even gets started before it stops. Whereas this song has dynamics, it grows, it has this feeling. It reminds me both in its, the way that it's written and the way that it's produced a lot of the song Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Stepaniste Zanebo, if you want to say it in Serbo-Croatian. I'm going to follow this metaphor a little bit more. Um, I said this to my wife, and she's like, you're crazy, that doesn't make any sense at all. But I, I, I'm still going to say it, even though she knows a lot more about Blaschkovic than I do. Primarily because of, there's, a, there's these little chords that come in. Boom, 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 where it builds up at the end of a verse or before a chorus. And it has that really epic feeling. They're both the combination of epic and intimate, which is something that Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin was able to do. This has some nice synthesizer work in it, beautiful flourishes with the guitar and the piano. Um, I can't even tell if it's like a guitar or a harpsichord playing all these little fine notes very fast. Um, it builds really nicely all the way throughout. Like there's this. Uh, Really, there's so much emotional strength in the music. Now, I'm not talking about the lyrics yet. The lyrics are the big deal about this song. If you're watching and you know this album, you're like, when's he gonna talk about the lyrics? But I'm interested because what I do is I listen to the album first a couple of times without knowing any of the lyrics and I just get my feeling from there. I think it's the piano line that gives the song so much strength and the way that it's played and the way that those chords are used. And then there's some tamburashi style, folky style, Yugoslavian style guitar coming in the back playing very nice uh, vocal uh, additions by uh, Kristic and then by an entire chorus and then at a certain point like the drums that have been kind of tinkling around start playing and he starts yelling I mean as close as he ever gets to yelling and just screams this line just over and over again and it has all the power that's been building up this is why it reminds me of Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, is that it has that feeling where you're just like, you're on a journey. The whole song is this journey, and you start one place and you end somewhere else, but then at a certain point, it just gets so amazingly like, like epic and exciting. Now, it's clear to me that the words are what matter here. But you know what, though? I want to play more of the music before we get to the lyrics, but I want to play you a little bit of this build-up that I'm talking about. In particular, just these little piano chords, boom, 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 which I think is what builds in this sense of, of intimacy and grandness. 
All right, I just put the record on now. It's starting to roll. We'll just listen to the beginning and the introduction here, the first couple lines where he introduces the concept. That might even be a 12-string guitar, or at least that very clear guitar has that kind of sound. The more I listen to this, the more I like this Led Zeppelin comparison, but... Not yet. We're still getting ready for that the chords. I'll go like this when those chords are coming. Not yet. Here it comes. That's it. That's the whole, the whole strength of the song is right in that moment. Bump, 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 bump. Right, look, real goosebumps right there. I'm not, I can't, I can't make that up. Let's get back to the lyrics. My wife. She doesn't like this song very much. <laughs> Can you believe it? I'm doing this whole series of videos for her, and she doesn't like Preacher O. Vasa Lachdaknum, Lachdanakum, Lakunochum. You have to understand, this, this song was everywhere. So it was sort of the favorite song of the lazy Balashevich fan. Mm. Haven't, you know. They haven't done the work yeah. to love. They haven't listened so to Moye Mommy 30 times like yeah, we have. So that, I think that was my own like silly, romantic, you know, teenager kind of. Right, right. You know. So this was the song that belonged to everybody else, yeah. but it didn't belong to you. Yeah. Now, let, hear me out here. Do you know what song I hated until I turned like 35? Stairway to Heaven. I love Led Zeppelin, one of my favorite groups, one of the most influential groups in my life. But I never, ever intentionally listened to Stairway to Heaven. I'd put on Led Zeppelin 4 and I would skip that track every time. I hated this song because it was everywhere. So it turns out, me, I don't know anything. I've never heard the story of Vasalach Tukum. It turns out that this is a very popular song. And I guess if you're watching this and you're from former Yugoslavia, you're laughing because I'm sitting here talking about a song that you know so well. But I, I like this parallel, right? This parallel that not only does it remind you of, uh, of it musically, it reminds me of it musically, but really of that same ubiquity. And how can we actually forgive artists for having success? And how can we forgive their most popular songs? It's actually quite difficult. My wife also tells me that there's a movie based on this song, and then a couple, of movies. a couple of movies based on this song. So if you're watching this and you're like me and you don't know anything about this, you're wondering like, well, what's this, what's this story about? It must be very complicated if there have been multiple movies about it. Are you ready for me to tell you what the song is about? Some guy who just wanted to be rich, so instead of marrying his sweetheart, he marries some rich woman, and then he dies. Cool story, bro. But what is the strength of it? I think the strength is from the music and from the way the story is told. It is very clear that his, his, poetic, his poetic powers are getting greater as time goes on. The funny thing about this whole experiment is that apparently his music gets way better and more interesting the later it goes on, but I don't know. It's gonna take me, it's gonna take me a long time to get there. So I'm just seeing it develop as it goes through here. So before we get to this guy drinking himself to death, let's think about the way that this song is structured. It's pretty simply structured. It starts off and it ends with, have you heard the story of Vasa Lachkum? Lach, Lachdukum? So Vasi Ladachkum. Ladachkum, okay. <laughs> yes, so have you heard the story about this guy? It ends with the same thing. Have you heard the story about this guy? It's pretty weird. And then it tells the story primarily through these choruses. But I wouldn't really call it a chorus as much as it is repeated lines. And these are the things that Vasa wants. I'm just not going to say his last name anymore. These are the things that he wants. He wants horses. But not work horses. Horses in a meadow. The most useless of all horses. He wants a watch. He wants a house. He wants a vineyard. And he wants a horse-drawn carriage. Okay? This is what he wants. And it's repeated three times. But what's interesting is each time it's repeated, there's a, a word that comes before the items and then a tagline, a sort of punchline that ends everything. So the first time he says he wanted 
all those things, the horses to watch, etc. Couldn't have it. Second time, got it. He got the horses, watch, and field, vineyards. And then it's tagged with, he had everything but had nothing. The third time it comes back, the Zaba Bilo. Jaba. Jaba Bilo, which turns out means worthless are. Worthless are all of these things when you are not with the one you love. That's the epic line that he yells and screams. So the story itself is fairly charming. I can see why they made it into a movie. It is tempting to see this as a purely romantic story about a failed love, okay? It paints the image of this, of this guy's father as a power, P-A-O-R, which is apparently a Voivodinian word for peasant. So again, always with Blasiewicz's music, we're going to be going back to the things that are regional and specific to, uh, to Vojvodina, the northern region of now Serbia and then Yugoslavia. But he's like, he's not, even though he is a power, he's not very, very poor. He is not lacking in money. He's not rich, but he's also not in extreme poverty. This guy's mother dies of tuberculosis, which apparently was a fairly common thing back then. And as a matter of fact, uh, my dear wife over there, her great-grandmother died of tuberculosis. And it seems as though that the way she was describing it, the life of this guy was very similar to the life of her grandfather. Would you say that's accurate? When I was a kid, I would think about my grandfather's childhood because he didn't grow up in extreme poverty, but you could have the sense that somehow his life was lacking. And the fact that his mother died when he was a teenager and, uh, you know, Vasa's mother died also, and he presumably would have been around that same age, made me kind of feel a connection to the song. Right. So that's, well, that's, that's an interesting story. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. But I do think it, it points to something about this, obviously, that he's able to tell these stories. And he gives details, but he always gives the right details, right? Like, this is a very good detail of the way that this thing happened. Uh, turns out how much land does he have? Uh, he gives the definition of how much land uh, Vasa's father owns, but it's in an archaic measurement. And much of the language for this whole song is in archaic language, uh, according to my wife, and I'm sure she's right. It's sort yeah. of it's sort of told almost like a storyteller, right? Yeah, like it, it sounds like a like a turn of the century story, right? Like maybe. Yeah. Maybe someone, you know, is, is wrote down a story as it was told in some Voivodinian pub in 1905, something like that. So it turns out uh, he has about three quarters of a soccer field, three quarters of a football pitch uh, of land. So not a lot, but a little bit. A great detail here. There was always bread, but Vasa wanted more. So this is the, this is the central problem of Vasa. Tempting as it may be to say that he suffers from greed. I think it goes deeper than greed. You're never going to guess what I think it goes to. Romanticism. We'll get there. So always about these useless black horses, this golden watch, these vineyards. And then he falls in love. We hear the story about him falling in love with a woman. We don't know anything about her except that it's true love. And that's where the drums come in. So that's the kind of the instrument, the instrumental indication that something is changing, right? Volesh jednom u životu, right? So you can only have one love in your life. The mind <coughs> doesn't decide, the heart does. And this is like, I almost hated this song when I heard this line. Because the idea of you can only love once in your life, first of all, I don't think it's true. Second of all, it's a terribly romantic idea. But still, it is an interesting concept that this person had love and is trading love in for these show horses. According to my wife, saying volesh is very, very voivodina. It should be, should be volish. So I don't know. I feel like I'm learning Serbian, Serbo-Croatian through Balashevic. So I'm going to like show up and speak with this weird accent. I'm like, volesh. So he leaves the village. Here's the first leaving happening on the album. And he leaves the village and it's sort of like a weird, like in the middle of the night, no one seems to know where he is. And he finds a mira, miradzika, which is an old fashioned miradzika, 
which is an old term for a dowry having woman, just a rich young woman who has a dowry. And here we have what will be referenced as him. I think it's also implied that she, because she needs a dowry to get married, that probably she is like not as desirable. I will say, we don't know anything about these women. Like there's a lot of women talked about on this album and very few of them have any defining characteristics at all. Most of them are just sort of there. And after he finds this Mirajika, he starts drinking and he, quote, sold his soul to the devil. And he tries to save himself at the bottom of a glass. A couple details are interesting here. I mean, obviously, the religious aspect of selling your soul to the devil, I don't think it's literal. I think it's metaphorical about him giving up this love that he had in order to get these horses and these useless things. Another thing that I like is when they talk about his death, or when Blasevich talks about his death, he says, people say. And that's one very important aspect here, is what is Balashevich's position in this story. He is very distant from Vasa. He is not trying to say, often when he tells a story in the third person, you get the sense he's talking about himself. This doesn't have that. This has a lot of distance. So why didn't my wife like the song? Well, it was everywhere. But also, as she told me, it's a little too romantic in that bad sense. Oh, this is what true love is, and it's so tragic, and you only live, or you only love once in your life. I'd like to put that aside, though. Yes, Vasa is a tragic, romantic figure in a way, because he dies of love. We could say he dies of love. We could say that this entire song is about the celebration of true love, and that without true love, we die. But I would say it's actually not. I believe this is a story about somebody who is incapable of living life on reality's terms. He actually has a romantic vision of himself. That is how all of these horses and these watches, that is what they mean. It is his dream. He doesn't actually want love. So he may have had love once, but that's not what he actually wants. He follows this romantic quest. And it's odd because it's a romantic quest away from love, but it's still an idealized quest. The repetition of these ridiculous things, this vineyard, okay, and these horses, which he gets, that's why Balashevich tells us he had everything and he had nothing. He had a dream, he followed his dream, he attained his dream, and the dream killed him. This is going to happen several times throughout this album. This is, a de this is a true romantic hero. Because much like Madame Bovary, <laughs> real romantic heroes die miserably. They are pathetic losers dying alone in a pub. That's what Balashevich presents to us here. <sighs> Amazing. Now, this is the funny thing. I love my wife, obviously. And so she doesn't like the first song. I mean, she likes it now because we've been talking about it nonstop for the last week, right? Yes, I do like <laughs> yeah, it Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great song. <laughs> I like it more. Yeah, it's an awesome you song. You made me like something of Balashevich more than I did before you. There you go. That's, that's pretty amazing. It is. But she appears to prefer the second track. That is the... I am a contrarian, but this is the most contrarian position you could possibly have. Yosh Yedna Gorka Pesma. Let's talk about that one. Okay, I'm gonna play you some of this music. So to understand Gorka Pesma, bitter song, we just have to listen to it because it is very important that the song itself be understood, the sound of the song. You know, we just heard Vasalach uh, Dom. You know, we just heard that whole song with its tamburashi guitar and its drums and its building. And here we have this just sort of odd blues song. So what we hear in there is just a very intentional bluesy sounding song with the effects on the guitar, the shuffling drum beat, 
But the thing is, this entire song is really in the ironic register. It is a very postmodern song. By that I mean it is not just a song, it is a song about songs. It's not just the blues, it's a blues song about singing the blues. Almost like a, a joke or some kind of an intentionally banal version of the blues. So to get to the lyrics, uh, you know, what is it that my wife likes so much? Well, I, it's really because this is one of these songs where Balashevich is talking about Balashevich. Who is he as an artist? The words we just heard there was him saying, you know, my life is bitter, everything is bitter, but I just keep singing sweet songs. And we have this kind of juxtaposition, uh, this juxtaposition between the bitter and the sweet. The gorko and the slatke. Uh, and he's sort of, uh, he's very self-effacing as he often is and talks about how he can't sing better. He just can't do it. And he, then he starts talking about the critics, about the music critics, saying he should just stick with his snasha, right? That song I mentioned previously, one of his goofy songs about just kind of walking around and, and sort of a nice story song, kind of a fun story song. And in order to really understand this, though, in order to understand Gorka Pesma, I think we actually have to go back to his first album, on Moy Friend i Ma Rock and Roll Bend. This is an accompaniment. This is the blues accompaniment to Moya Friend in my rock and roll band. Moya Friend, if you don't know, is a song in which he talks about how his friend is in a rock and roll band, how he, Bolashevic, wishes he could do the yay, yay, yay and make music that makes people tear their head out, but instead he just sings nice ballads for old ladies. He does this exaggeration of rock and roll. He makes an intentionally cheesy rock and roll song in order to lament his inability to rock but not really, he's actually celebrating his ability to make other music. It's this weird thing that Balashevich is capable of doing, of criticizing himself and praising himself all at the same time. So it's like, I can't do this thing, but actually what I do is better. And so this song, Gorka Pesma, is an exaggeration of the blues in a similar way. And you can see it as an inability to sing the blues, that that's what the song is about because his life is not bitter. So he can't do the real bitter thing. But really it's the question of what kind of artist is he? Is he Gorko? No, he's Slatne. He's sweet. And this is fundamentally a celebration of his sweetness. He also makes reference, one of my new favorite words in, in Serbo-Croatian, uh, nadri, uh, nadri kirtikar. Kritičar. What? Nadri kritičar. Nadri kritičar. Which, if I ever make t-shirts, I want a picture of me and have it say, Nadri kritičar. Because it means like a music critic who... Uh, Without qualifications. Yeah, who doesn't have any qualifications. And that's what I am. I am your Nadri kritikar. Because I'm, I'm not really a music critic. I really am a professor of French at a small public university in Western New York. But here I am being a kritichar. 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 Okay, let's get to the next song. Now we're getting to one of my favorite songs on the album, Nisan Bio Yaza New. I wasn't for her. Now when I first listened to this song, my initial notes before knowing the lyrics was kind of a silly and sweet song. I sort of got this, I suspected that maybe it isn't one of the important songs on the album. Cool kind of funky sounding organ, very, almost like a country sounding song, the way that it's sung. Reminds me a little bit of like pop country from the late 70s. Boshek is working ridiculously hard on the guitar here. Very catchy, that's the main thing. This chorus, Nisan Bio Yaza New, is very catchy, very engaging. Um, but lyrically is where the song takes most of its interest for me. That's the ways in which this third song on the album is actually very connected to the first two. First off, it's connected to Gorka Pesma because he's putting himself down. Uh, if you don't know what the song is about, it's about this woman who is too sophisticated and he's too much of like a country bumpkin who just likes stupid things and doesn't understand it. And there's this whole side to it where he mocks himself. At some point he calls himself superficial because he loves uh, soccer, Coca-Cola, and Pink Floyd. Which, by the way, he rhymes with Freud. So in a way, he's looking down on himself. 
But much like we see with Gorka Pesma and my friend Imel Rock and Roll Band, whenever Blasevich puts himself down, he's usually also lifting himself up at the same time. As we will discover, this woman isn't actually as interesting as she thinks he is. I think we could compare this to the first song as well, the story of Vasaraktum, because it is about a fancy woman who is not for him, okay? His rank would have gone up if he got with this woman, even if she turns out to be more shallow than we think. His station would have gone up, yet he chooses not to. It seems to me that this is an alternate timeline for Vasa. What if Vasa lived in the, 20, in the 20th century and met this woman and just said, uh, she's not for me. Now what's funny is he says, I was not for her. That's the way the song is constructed, right? But in reality, what we'll see is that she is not for him. And he is choosing wisely. He is choosing not to follow any kind of superfi the true superficiality that she represents. Now, she's the, the way that she's presented is pretty funny. And I actually want to go back to one of the literary figures that's been dominating this whole, uh, this whole video, and that is Madame Bovary. In English, I don't know if this exists in Serbian, uh, Serb Croatian. It does exist in French, of course. It's called Bovarism. Do you have that term? No, you probably just think we're talking about a cow. So Bovarism <laughs> pertains to uh, Krava. So Madame Bovary is defined by this desire to have a higher station in life. Um, is this glamorized view of yourself, which is very tied in, again, to the concept of romanticism. Madame Bovary herself is just a fairly pedestrian wife of a country doctor, but she sees herself as almost like some kind of grand duchess who's destined to have some great life. But in reality, she's not very much. We have this Bovarism, this offshoot of Romanticism, this inability to see yourself to be connected to reality. Because the way that this woman is described is as the great-granddaughter of a Russian prince, which means nothing, right? Uh, it says that she's seen the whole world, and he gives four locations in Europe, right? She's just kind of a boring woman who has these airs. And also, on top of that, she's something of a busybody. She just likes to talk constantly about people behind their back. And we had this image at the end of him coming to visit, you know, seeing her after he decided that they shouldn't be together. And he describes his life as just being carefree and, and, and just a happy guy. And she basically says, oh, it's all your fault that you're like that. And then she goes on to gossip. But this is one of my favorite songs. So let's, let's just have a listen to the, to the amazingly catchy chorus, this kind of pop country style chorus and just the, the ease with which he describes his life and the way he just says, she, I was not the one for her. <laughs> Boshek is such a great guitar player. We, I, yeah, I have to listen. What was that band he was in at first? Kornigrupa. Grupa. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's as good as this, because, wow, is his guitar playing great. Okay, moving on to the next song. On first listen to the song Menuet, I could tell this is an important one. It is such a delicately and beautifully composed song. It starts off with another kind of Queen-style guitar intro. Uh, there's a song like that on the first album as well, where you have sort of these weird, nice harmonies played with the guitars. Very sweeping, even some Spanish guitar, some electric guitar, really just guitar opening, really just Boshek just still going wild here. The voice is really loud in the mix, which is quite interesting. Now, the whole song is called Minuet, uh, you know, the musical form. And what's funny here is that at the end of the chorus, I'm gonna play this for you in a second, at the end of a chorus, a classical piece of music is played. I can't quite place it exactly, which classical piece this is. If you know, please put it in the comments. But the point is, he's making reference to a much older song, a song form, and a much older song. And he's mixing together the classical aesthetic and the kind of rock pop aesthetic. And he's able to really reconcile them all together. So let's listen to this chorus as it goes into this just absolutely beautiful section. 
And what's important is the lyrics, as we'll discover, are about disappearing into the minuet, like disappearing into the music. And as you listen to the chorus, you actually disappear into this music itself. It's really quite effectively done. Let's listen. There's those little notes of Queen in the back with that electric guitar. It's funny because again on Moyo Mami he talks about, there's a whole song called Old Song Stata Pesma which integrates a song by uh, Todo Vaz, Zorice Zorure. And it's funny because here he's integrating an even older song. You know, where <laughs> Blasevic seems to constantly be throwing his music back. Uh, lyrics, this is another failed love song. So the first track was a failed love song. The second track was about not being bitter. Third song was a failed love song. Fourth song here is a failed love song. And in that way, it's very tied into the previous one. It's very tied into Nissan Bio. But of course, Nissan Bio is kind of a tongue in cheek song about this woman who thinks that she's very sophisticated when she really isn't. Here, it's a song about a woman who probably is very sophisticated or who probably is worthy of Balashevich's love. I think actually, <laughs> we could have switched the song titles. This song, I think, could be called I Wasn't For Her. In Nissan Bio, he leaves her, or he breaks up, I mean, uh, in, uh, in, yeah, Nissan Bio, he breaks up with her, or they break up, because she thinks he is beneath her, and he is pretending that she is correct. Very complicated, okay. He, he's pretending to agree that he is beneath her. But here, we get the sense that the cynicism that we have towards the invisible female granddaughter of a Russian prince, great-granddaughter, the cynicism that we feel towards her is replaced by genuine admiration. Whatever there is about this woman who he's leaving, it is a loss. Is this Vasa again? Is this, is this who Vasa was leaving to go find the dowager? I mean, you know, it, I don't think so, but I think it's pretty funny how tied it in it is, where already we have three men leaving relationships for different reasons. Both Nissan Bio and Menuet have a last verse that's talking about staying in touch with this former lover. In Nissan Bio, she says, well, <laughs> you're pretty lame and it's your fault. But in Minuet, it's much more bittersweet. It's much more hinted at what's really meant. She just says that she stays in touch rarely. So here we have this woman. Is she above his station? I don't know. I don't know if we're supposed to assume that she is. If her knowledge of Bach and Chopin and Liszt, I think it does. I think it implies that she is above him because he's a musician and he is not playing Bach. He probably couldn't play Bach if he wanted to, right? He's not that level of talent, where she is in this sort of higher level, this kind of higher plane. What do you think? Do you, do you think that she's above him? Do you think we're supposed to think? I'm asking my wife now, not the dogs. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just having fun imagining Bo having an opinion on Bach. Yes. Um, I, I don't know. I think I think you're right. I think he is maybe leaving her for her own good. Yeah. And he was, you know, he was leaving the other woman for his good, but also in a way that would spare her ego by saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm not good enough for you. One thing I love about this sad story, again, what are the details that he gives? As a storyteller, you know... <laughs> You can just give endless details, right? If you're telling a story, you could talk about the, you know, the color of the, the different shades of green on a, a plant leaf, or you could talk about the, the ticking of the clock. You know, you could pick all these details. This is the sweetest detail. She has a, she has a dog, and she has to get, he has to get the dog to move. And the way he says it is like, 
you know, get out of here, dog. But then also he's sweet with the dog at the same time. And, and he then, whispers it in the yeah, song. Yeah, he whispers it. It's gentle. It's gentle. And then he sees a geranium on the porch. And so what is this woman really? What does she represent? She represents someone who can have a dog. If you've ever been in your early 20s and you've traveled a lot and you love dogs, you're out of luck. You don't get to have a dog. You need to be, have some kind of stability, some kind of home. The geranium is for a home. And he even mentions that this might be the home for him, but he has to leave. And what's amazing is he actually refers to himself here as Don Quixote, Don Quixote himself, which further complicates this question of romanticism. If he sees himself as a quixotic character, is he tragic or is he heroic? This rambler, this vagabond, this man who leaves. The first song's about the man who left in the middle of the night. Here a man is leaving in the morning. And we have the reality of the rambling man. All throughout rock and roll history, popular music history, the rambling man, never a rambling woman, the rambling man is a very romantic figure. Let's think of one of the most popular songs. I've already talked about Stairway to Heaven, so why not talk about another overlong classic rock hit from the 70s, Free Bird by Leonard Skinnerd. The song, which is ubiquitous with live concerts and people singing along, the whole song is just, I'm as free as a bird. You can't chain me. I have to fly away, girl. We had a great time last night, but you can't change me. I'm a free man. Almond Brothers, Ramblin' Man, and when it's time for leaving, I hope you understand. Lord, I was born a Ramblin' Man. What can I do? Leonard Skinner tells me that I cannot change. You cannot change me. I'm a free bird. The Almond Brothers say, I hope you understand, but I was born a Ramblin' Man. Nowhere in those songs and nowhere in the tropes, the romantic trope of a vagabond is the reality of the rambler. They are not happy. They are sad. Balashevich does not let you romanticize his leaving even for a second. I am still wandering. Where does the road end? Many of the provincial railways remember me hidden by dark and cheap taverns. For me, nights are sometimes desolate and long. Then I disappear into my own world in minuet. He disappears into the minuet, which is the memory of this woman that he left. He's a sad, dark, cheap tavern. I mean, he's not Vasa, okay? He's not the same guy, but he is sort of the same guy. He doesn't have the dog. He doesn't have the plant. He's just here. Yes, he is free, but he's free from happiness. For him, life is a provincial railway. For him, life is a dusty road. Life is... What is life on this album? Life is a sea! I don't know if that was cute or funny, but I thought it would be cute and funny. Uh, what is life? Well, life is also a sea. Now, I've already talked about this song in a previous video that I did about Balashevich's early singles. And this is a much older song, but I think it's on here on purpose because it fits the themes of the album quite well. Musically, I'm just going to play it for you a little bit more right now before diving into the lyrics. Uh, basically, the music is just an excuse for this poem. Just a beautiful poem about life being the sea. But musically, it's still quite a good song. This ends the first half of the album. It ends the first side. And it's an important way to end the first side with in a similar kind of emotional space as the first song. Just sort of a, a, a lament about lost life is lost and love is lost, etc. So let's listen a little bit here. This beautiful guitar work, again by Boshek, piano and guitar going so nicely together. Kind of a cool like Moog synthesizer, I think, in the back. 
Uh, nice singing in the background, a little bit by uh, Christich there. I almost wonder if her voice isn't supposed to evoke a siren, you know, like a siren in the sea, because this is all based on naval themes. Um, a lot of different things happening here. So let's listen a little bit to the song, Givote Yamore, Life is a Sea, without me singing in English. She's singing along. So let's get into this poem. I don't know. Okay, every time I do one of these videos, people politely tell me that I will never understand Balashi Beach fully because I don't speak Serbo Croatian. And I never refute that fact. I am a language teacher. I know that when I read Proust, I get something out of it that you can't get out of it if you don't read French. That's just a fact. Now, it's still worth reading Proust in English, and it's still worth studying Balashevich, but a song like this really drives it home how much I might be, listen I might be missing. Let's just take the first line. Jivot yemore puchina serna. In English, what? Life is a sea. That is a metaphor, okay? Metaphor versus simile. Metaphor, a thing is another thing, okay? Simile, something is like something else. So life is not like a sea. It's not jivo ya cow, more, which is how you'd say that in Serbian. I'm learning Serbo Croatian. Life is a sea. But another thing about Serbo Croatian is that there are no articles, okay? So when I met my wife, she speaks English basically perfectly, but she doesn't know how to say bodies of water because she can't bring herself to say, I used to live by the Danube. She would just say, I used to live by Danube. Like using an article was almost impossible for her in English. Jivot je more is not only not a simile, it's three words to communicate this thing. Life is sea. It is sea. To take it even further, how we can't really understand this if we listen to the English translation. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to do this for the whole song. Puccina Serna. This is how we translate the first lines. Life is a sea. A black, open sea. But there's no repetition of the word more. It's not jivot ye more, more serna. No, there's a whole nother word for the open sea. Puccina. Which should not be confused with the ocean. This apparently is a term, my wife was describing it to me, in which it's also when you look at the ocean and the horizon and the ocean meet and they go on to infinity, that's Puccina. Different languages have different poetic potential. It's just the way languages work. The fact that certain words exist, the fact that certain words rhyme with other words actually make those words have more meaning in poetry. If you have a language which has a word for where the sky and the ocean meet into infinity, you better use that word. And that word has an amazing strength to it. Okay? It's funny because in the last album, he personified life as a gambler who always cheats. This is the second album in a row in which Balashevich personifies life. As I said in my previous review, most artists personify death. That's a lot more interesting to personify death. But here, well, maybe he's not personifying it, but he is at least transforming life into something else. So it's not a gambler who cheats. It's people who sink when they sail. My heart is not a fearful doe. A doe? Okay, like, like not a fearful doe? My heart is not a fearful doe? Well, it is the, the animal that kind of um, exemplifies um, femininity in Serbian. Okay. And also um, kind of like 
fragility and like delicateness. So that's all wrapped up in that one word. Yeah. You see, <laughs> to, to translate one word, you need a paragraph. Thematically, he's still scared of his past. This is another theme that pops up. He talks about in early mornings, the shadows of past days scare me. Memories unclear like in a lie, like in a dream. So it's these memories that come back. Are they the memories of the minuet? I don't know. Are they Vasa's memories of the one true love who he left so he could have horses and watches? I don't know, but I think probably. And then we see how is he going to get out of this? If he's sinking, if he's, the hands are pulling him down, how is he going to do it? A woman. Maybe a woman will be my port. Is this going to save him? Hey, you've been listening to this album, haven't you? This is not the answer. He is not going to be saved by some woman. Absolutely not. We've had five songs Okay, one is dedicated to the blues, one is partly about finding the right woman who might save you, and then three are dedicated to the failure of not finding the right woman. And here he is, probably going to drown. He doesn't appear to be learning his lesson. He is lost on the waves. Just as he was lost on the road, just as he is lost on the railway, he is constantly going away, he is constantly a vagabond, and the reason that his givote is more, the reason that his life is a sea, is because he keeps leaving. And that's why he will always feel these unclear memories like in a dream. One more poetic note about the song before we flip over the album. Did you know, in Serbo-Croatian, <clears throat> this is the same as that. Ruke Ruke. What's up with that? Talk about poetic possibilities. Hand and arm are the same words. So when he talks about hands pulling him down, he uses the word ruke. And when he talks about maybe a woman's arms, maybe someone will meet him with open arms, she also uses ruke. I think this might be intentional. I love this stuff. Okay, let's flip over the album finally. <laughs> All right, well, let's flip this album over from side A to side B. Part two. Coming soon. Just have to finish editing it. What did you think of the crazy editing? Anyways, uh, these are my Patreons. Uh, the money that they give me, I use to buy music. So thank you very much to them. Oh my god, you know what? I got the I got the accents wrong on this one. One second, I have to go, I have to go get them. So, M Milos has the angry eyebrows, right? Yeah, sure. Angry eyebrows, and Spaso Yevich has the accent aigu on the C, right? All right. So anyways, these are all people who've been helping me out. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for part two coming soon. Side B, Odazi, Circus, Circus, Circus.